Good morning. I'm Darrell West, Vice President of Governance Studies at Brookings. I'm pleased to welcome you to our webinar on R&D for the public good. Investing in research and development is one of the most important things that we do. In 2020, for example, the United States spent about $708 billion on R&D, according to figures from the National Science Foundation. Most of this money, uh, $517 billion, came from the private sector with about $143 billion coming from the public sector. And this is a big change from 40 years ago when the public and private sectors devoted roughly the same amount of money to R&D. But over the past four decades, private investment has skyrocketed as a percentage, while public sector investment has grown at a much smaller rate. At one level, there's nothing wrong with businesses having primacy over government in R&D spending. America has a vibrant private sector that enables business leaders to scan the landscape, decide where the investment opportunities are, and position their firms for a future growth. Yet, at another level, there are problems with the bulk of R&D money coming from the business community. So, for example, vital national interests may get overlooked to the detriment of the overall country. Profitable consumer products likely will get advantaged over unprofitable societal innovations, even if the latter are important for public health and national security. And then finally, innovations uh, that need to get financed in order to promote longer term public goods may receive short shrift over items that promise a quick uh, payoff. In recent years, we've seen business leaders outsource key products and components to other nations, such as China, India, and South Korea. As an example, the semiconductor manufacturing sector largely has been outsourced to Taiwan and South Korea. Uh, The same thing has happened with medical supplies and drugs. Many of these items are manufactured in India and China. And during the pandemic, uh, many American healthcare providers found it difficult to get the personal protective equipment and the pharmaceutical medications uh, that they uh, needed. Uh, This week, uh, Brookings has put out a paper that I wrote entitled R&D for the Public Good, uh, Ways to Strengthen Societal Innovation in the United States. And it analyzes the current situation and makes a number of recommendations in order to improve the status quo. So for example, I argue we need to boost public sector investment in R&D, We need to use federal money to redress geographic inequities, uh, that we need to deploy R&D to help with climate change. We need to elevate equity as an allocation of principle in the way that we're using uh, federal money. We need to provide greater flexibility to state and local governments because uh, they often are closer uh, to uh, what is needed in their community and have a better sense of how to uh, use the money. And then we need to uh, 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 devote money to train the next uh, generation of uh, STEM uh, leaders. So if you want more uh, details on the uh, paper, it is available uh, free of charge online at brookings.edu, and I will refer uh, you to uh, that site uh, if you uh, need uh, further uh, details on that. To help us understand these issues, we're delighted to have two distinguished experts with us today. Carol Robbins is a senior analyst in the Science, Technology, and Innovation Analysis Program of the National Center of Science and Engineering Statistics at the National Science Foundation. And uh, that is the uh, part of NSF that actually compiles R&D data and and they provide a tremendous uh, resource for uh, researchers who are interested in looking at those trends. And then also with us, we have uh, John Villasenor, who's a professor of engineering at UCLA and also a non-resident senior fellow at uh, Brookings. Now, if you have questions for our panelists, you can email them to us at events at brookings.edu, that's events at brookings.edu, or tweet at brookings.gov by using hashtag US innovation. So uh, we're happy to uh, take uh, any questions that you have through either one of those uh, means. So I'd like to start with uh, Carol. I mean, you analyze R&D data from the National Science Foundation what is covered by federal funding uh, right now, and how do you assess the long-term R&D trends? So one of the issues in terms of the difference between business funding and federal funding that you've described has to do with the fact that um, 
business funding has increased at a very rapid rate. So 90% increase over the past 10 years. And the federal funds for R&D have increased, but at a much slower rate. So what, what that means is that you see that dramatic shift in the shares of total spending that goes on. One of the things I think that is most important about federal funding is that federal funding is the primary source of funding for basic research, right? It's conducted in universities and in federal labs, but the money is coming from the federal government. Now it is true that business has increased their share of basic research, but not to the extent to, to make up for that which comes from federal funds. And so I really do think that when we think about basic research, that fundamental engine of growth, those monies are still coming from the federal government. Carol, just a quick follow-up question on that. Are there areas that you think need more investment? So actually that's a little bit outside of my portfolio. I can tell you where the federal funding is going and a lot of it is going into areas of health and biotechnology. And of course, we've seen the great benefit that has come from the Human Genome Project. I think that the National Science Foundation has taken a direction to um, expand what they call the geography of innovation and make sure that the benefits of federally funded R&D are spread more uniformly across the country. And there have been several programs that have been stood up recently to address that need. So John, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. And we know that uh, much of our current R&D uh, comes from the private sector and that that has generated lots of new products and services. But are there things that are not being covered by businesses that would benefit the entire society? Uh, John, you are on mute. If you could unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Um, businesses tend to fund research that, logically enough, they see as furthering their goals as businesses, which means that they're less likely to fund things that might be very important from a, at a societal level, but doesn't directly impact the business. I'll, I'll give you an example. And, and Carol, and you both have sort of alluded to it. Um, the infrastructure, uh, the things like the integrated circuit to chip supply, um, critical infrastructure in the United States. Um, there's just a, an array of areas where there's a very strong need for uh, advancing the technology, but it may not be directly within the portfolio of corporate R&D funding. Uh, and that's an area where I think the United States government funding can play just an absolutely vital role. So Carol, one of the goals of R&D is to spur innovation, but sometimes we're not entirely sure what we mean by innovation and then also how we should be measuring innovation. So I'd be curious uh, your thoughts on what we mean by innovation and how we can measure it. So Daryl, I think that's a really interesting question, especially given the topic of this discussion. When we're thinking about innovation, um, the data that we have in the federal statistical system comes from very high quality business surveys and firm businesses are asked, have you introduced a substantially new product or process in the last three years? And we have really good information about that. And what we can say at the industry level is pharmaceuticals, chemicals, computer industry, very high rates of introducing these new products and processes. What we don't know as well is about the innovation that is taking place in universities, governments, and in households. And so when we think about those benefits, um, we just don't have the knowledge or the tools at the current moment to see the innovation that's going on in the government. And yet we know that it's there and we know that investment takes place perhaps 20, 30 years ago and leads to great advances now. For example, all the work that was done, as you mentioned in your report on the vaccines and the human genome project, Clearly, that's an example of very strong government innovation, and we don't have measures for it. So we just don't know. John, I'd like to get your uh, thoughts on that as well. Yeah. I mean, so what I, do we I, mean little, by innovation, and how can we measure it? I mean, I do a personal anecdote. I teach several times a week right now in the very same building at UCLA where the very first internet message was sent uh, in 1969. Um, and, you know, it, had you tried to measure, and that, of course, as, as everyone I think knows, that was 
funded by uh, by the government, by, by the Department of Defense. Uh, and had you tried to measure the result of that funding in, say, 1974, five years later in 1979, maybe people would have said, well, you know, really, has it really had that much impact? But of course, well, the internet has had a lot of impact. It just took a few decades, right? It took, took till the really sort of the mid nineties before it really took off at a global level. And so I, I, the, the reason I mentioned that is because by definition, some of this basic research can take decades sometimes to play out. And if you look at you know the extraordinary work that was done in relation to the COVID vaccines, there was a lot of amazing work done just in the last several years, but the foundation for that work was decades of funding, much of it from the government uh, in you know, the sort of fundamental basic research that made these vaccines possible. So I think it's a long way of saying, one way to measure innovation is to look at sort of direct short-term outputs, you know, companies and job creation and new products and things like that. But there is a, a, a segment, a vitally important segment of, of, the, of, of the results of these uh, investments that will not become clear until decades later. And I think that's a good thing because government is the best place uh, to actually fund the kind of research that can be world changing on those time scales. So Carol, you mentioned that the federal government has introduced several new programs in an effort to diversify funding and also spread it out a little more equitably on a geographic uh, basis. Could you talk a little bit about some of those programs and how they operate and what they're trying to accomplish? Well, I think one of the most significant ones is a new directorate in the National Science Foundation called Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships. And the overall goals for this are really some of the things that we're talking about, boosting innovation capacity, create sustainable innovation ecosystems, and demonstrate inclusive growth. And so I really do think that this is an example of the kind of translational work that we are talking about. And so what, the, um, what this program will do is set up regional innovation engines to begin the um, process of finding translational work. So use-inspired research and development, the translation of innovation with results to society, and quite importantly, workforce development to grow and sustain regional innovation, because we know very well that the full demographic breadth of the United States is not engaged in our science and, um, science and engineering or our innovation programs. And then I think um, more broadly than the National Science Foundation, a very critical project that the federal government has been engaged in is citizen science. And so citizen science is a way that people can become involved in creating, collecting data that's critical to their own lives, whether it's in terms of environmental quality or in terms of health issues. And some of it is really the exciting stuff that might be a little more pie in the sky, like looking at the stars. But those kinds of things enable people to be part of the scientific process and also to address their needs, especially when we're talking about health and the environment. And so I think those are areas where people become engaged with researchers and innovators and can get drawn into the process. And there's growth in this activity at the federal level. And John, I'd also like to get your thoughts on this effort on the part of the federal government to diversify funding and spread the money out a, a little more equitably across. The I, I think I think it's absolutely a terrific idea. There's extraordinary human capital all over the country, and um, a lot of those incredibly talented people are at uh, these emerging, what are sometimes called emerging research institutions, uh, institutions that have not. Uh, traditionally gotten nearly the funding support that they deserve. And I think um, it's a win-win situation. Um, I think we're going to get better innovation because we're funding more people. Uh, and of course, it's it's good for those institutions to grow their portfolios and to attract students. And, and so it's a win-win all around. I think it's, it's great. And I'm glad that uh, the United States government is focusing on that. So Carol, I'm curious about any comparisons between what the United States is doing versus other uh, nations, just in terms of the amount of money being devoted to R&D. Is the United States keeping up? Or are we falling behind in uh, certain areas? I mean, what's your sense of kind of the, the global landscape? So I think the most uniform way to think about um, the effort that an economy is making on R&D is R&D expenditures as a share of gross domestic product. And we look at that quite a bit. I know in your report, you look at federal funding as a share of GDP, 
And I think that an integrated perspective is a useful one as well. And the reason that I say that is that um, federal funding, government funding, and private funding have been shown in many studies to be complements, right? They fuel each other and interrelate, not substitutes, right? Not one is better than the other. And so when one has a robust system of both private and federal R&D, that uh, can generate strong growth. So the US has ranged in between two and a half to just under 3% of GDP for the past uh, many years, but recently it has cranked up to 3%. So we see a bit of an increase. Now there are uh, economies and nations that spend more in terms of their overall um, federal G, um, their GDP. So South Korea would be one where they have um, a measure above 3%. And actually China is just about where we are at 3%. But John, how do you see what is happening in the United States compared to other uh, countries? Are there other countries that you think are doing uh, R&D differently or better? Well, I don't know about uh, better, but certainly, uh, for example, China, I think, has a very uh, strategic approach to how uh, it integrates its uh, public and private sector R&D. And obviously, China is you know, a very different, very different country, uh, and the, the ties between the government and the private sector are, are very different than they are uh, in the United States. Um, but I do think that sometimes um, in the United States, we would benefit from a more sort of holistic kind of strategic approach to some of the R&D funding, particularly in light of some of the sort of longer term geopolitical you know, challenges of maintaining American economic competitiveness in a very competitive environment in terms of you know, ensuring that we've got good uh, supply chain uh, control, or at least you know, so are not vulnerable to supply chain, the kinds of supply chain disruptions that we saw during the pandemic really in hindsight that shouldn't have happened, right? We shouldn't have we shouldn't have been in a position where you know health frontline healthcare workers didn't have you know personal protective equipment. That just you know, that doesn't make sense. And so, um, the sort of strategic investments that can avoid that kind of dislocation in the future is something that we could probably do a better job of doing. So, Carol, one of the other aspects of uh, innovation concerns human talent, and I know NSF as well as other uh, federal agencies are devoting. Uh, a lot of efforts to try and develop uh, new talent, uh, support uh, STEM education, and so on. Could you describe some of the activities that are taking place there and how that may position the United States for success down the road? So I don't have a full picture of all of the activities that are going on at NSF, but clearly it's an area of great interest. What we have started to do is really collect better data. And so um, one thing that we have been working on is greater demographic richness, right? Many times we can tell you how many R&D researchers there are and whether they're men and women, but we don't always have um, enough granularity in the data to tell us about different demographic groups. Um, we also know that people with disabilities are less likely to be engaged in science and engineering and innovation. And so when we are able to highlight these things in the data, it gives an opportunity for policy to address this. The other thing that we have done is we've recently put together uh, a set of statistics on skilled workers who have less than a bachelor's degree because this breadth of science and engineering activity and innovation needs more people than just people with an advanced graduate degree. And so what we see is that while the skilled workforce with less than a bachelor's degree is more broadly spread in the United States than that with advanced degrees, nevertheless, um, you, what you find is that perhaps in the middle parts of the country, you've got more of these skilled workers, less people with advanced degrees, but it tells you that there's an opportunity for growth there and for an expansion of the kinds of activities that are taking place. So. What I can tell you is about what we measure in terms of our workforce and what we want to measure better. We want to measure demographics better and also the geographic distribution so that we have benchmarks that policy can measure against. So John, how would you assess the job the United States is doing in developing the next generation of talent and are there 
other things we should be doing better in that area? You know, I think in general, uh, we have a, a really robust system of R&D and, and higher education. And in that sense, uh, you know, in a kind of broad sense, I think we're doing really well. Could we do better? Yeah, I think we could. I think uh, the focus on emerging research institutions is one example of how we can do better. Um, I still think there are going to be uh, people who fall through the cracks, institutions that fall through the cracks that don't get the research support that they deserve and could do amazing things if they received. Um, and I also think another, I guess, the thing I would say is even if you look within the sort of more traditional research institutions, you know, the, what are sometimes called the R1 research institutions, uh, we can do a better job of, of engaging people in those institutions, right? I am quite sure, you know, I, there's, I have had the privilege of working with amazing students at UCLA, but I'm sure there are some students at UCLA who, are, who would be amazing and be interested in doing research, but for whatever reason, don't get the opportunity or don't get connected to the research activities that are going on, even at these places. So I think we can do a better job at, at, at being kind of more inclusive uh, to even within these sort of traditionally uh, institutions where you have a lot of traditionally high research activity. So there's a lot of room for improvement. So, Daryl, I'd like to add another point on this issue of the science and engineering workforce, and that is for many years, um, and this is something that we measure in our NCSES data, um, foreign-born scientists and engineers have played an oversized role relative to their numbers in some of our um, in most innovative in in industries, and many of these people have advanced degrees and are engineers. And so one of the challenges is while we need to welcome these people and we need them in our workforce because they are critical, we need to also find a way to be growing our own. And so what we see when we look at the issues that may be related there is we see performance on K through 12 education in science uh, where the US is underperforming some of its um, advanced economy peers and challenges um, engaging people to enter STEM careers and also to stay there. And, and, and if I could just add you know, a point that's almost, it's almost so obvious that I, I, I feel it doesn't need to be made, but I'll make it anyways, you know, we still suffer in, in STEM from a, a very significant gender disparity. Um, you know, I, I look around my classes in, in engineering and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's not anywhere near 50%, you know, in terms of the, the, the male female split. And so what that means of necessity is that we're missing out on an extraordinary amount of, of female talent. Um, and I know there are very complex reasons for that, but that's something that I think we should, we should be continuing to endeavor uh, to, uh, to create more opportunities there. Yeah, we definitely need to do uh, better on the uh, gender front and as Carol pointed out on the immigrant uh, front. I always like to remind people of these studies that have shown half of the Silicon Valley companies right. had an immigrant founder or co-founder. And so the story of American technology innovation is very much intertwined with the story of immigration. And of course, now we're in a time period where immigration is more contentious, more controversial. There are people who uh, want to cut back on that. And I think they don't necessarily realize if we're cutting back on immigration, we actually may end up cutting back on technology innovation just because there aren't a sufficient number of native born American students who are going into these uh, STEM fields. Yeah, I just, I just, I, I see this, you know, at, you know, every day and um, yeah, that's just incredibly important. Not only do these people found companies, but they create enormous numbers of jobs when they find these companies. And a lot of these people who found these companies, they are some of the world's most incredibly innovative, brilliant people. They can go anywhere. Um, and if, and if the United States doesn't welcome them, then they will create their companies somewhere else and create those jobs somewhere else. And, and they will. Um, and so that's just incredibly important. So we're starting to get some questions from our audience. And I do want to remind people, if you'd like to ask uh, questions, you can email them to us at events at brickings.edu. That's events, uh, brick, uh, events at brickings.edu or to tweet at brookings.gov using hashtag US uh, innovation. So we have a question from Renu Kuklarni of Discovery Partners Institute. And this individual wants to know how industry and university partners can work together in order to advance R&D. Carol, you wanna talk about that? How yeah, can that's one thing I think. Yeah, I, I can say one of the things that um, we do measure is um, 
when there is a technology transfer office in a university, then not only are the data visible, right? The licenses that come, the patents, the startup companies that are based on the university's technology. And we can see growth there and we can measure it. However, technology transfer offices are not ubiquitous. They are not in every university. And so um, one thing that does come to mind, and my understanding is they are not cheap things to set up. So where those um, offices are not in place, that at least provides an opportunity to set something up that can focus on that activity. So John, uh, what is your sense of how industry and universities can work together in order to advance R&D? So yeah, that's a really important question. I would say <clears throat> in addition to the more sort of formal mechanisms that Carl was alluding to, uh, there are also what you might call sort of uh, informal mechanisms in the sense that I, I, I think a lot of industry, uh, industry funding is spurred by earlier government funding. And so even though there might not be an explicit collaboration, <clears throat> you know, once government funding has sort of provided some momentum to a particular area of research, that will make it more attractive for industry people to then come in and continue that funding, even though there may not be any sort of formal collaboration. So there's a there's a sort of a, a seeding effect that happens with a lot of this industry, with a lot of the government funding, which then spurs a bunch of industry funding. And that's a form of what you might call in, informal collaboration that I really think is very important. So we have a question from Timothy Wojohn of the National Science Foundation. And Tim wants to know if uh, John or Carol, either of you have any ideas for increasing funding for what he calls hard problem R&D that are often difficult or impossible to raise money for from the private sector? I'll let John do that one. <laughs> yeah, that's a, it's, a, it's, a hard, it's a hard question to answer. So the hard problem question is a hard question to answer. You know, I think um, what I would say is that when I've ever I've talked to program managers at places like DARPA, I've just been really impressed by the sort of very kind of almost entrepreneurial approach they have. And they know that they're funding um, high, some high risk things. Uh, and I think um, I think there is an appreciation among people at funding agencies that the hard problems in quantum computing being a, a, a really good example of a really hard problem, but that is getting quite a bit of research funding, right? Um, and so I think if if the people who are working on the hard problems can articulate the vital importance of those problems, and again, I'll, I'll use quantum computing as an example where the importance is indisputably vital, then I think the funding will flow. I think when you have a hard problem, when it's harder to articulate the sort of the payoff of it's solved, that's when it gets harder to, to get funding. And Carol, if I could extend uh, that question just a little bit, kind of beyond the NSF to just, in my paper, for example, I suggest we need to devote more R&D to issues such as climate change, income inequality, racial injustice, governance challenges, like all the big uh, challenges that we are facing as a society right now. Uh, how is either the federal government or the private sector addressing these societal types of questions kind of beyond the issue of consumer products that they might be interested in developing? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. And so then the issue is, well, how do we measure those things, right? And what data do we look at? And on the area of climate change, there is an area that we can look, um, which isn't perfect, of course, but that's patents. And of course, we know that most patents come from the business sector. There are many reasons why a federal government uh, would not patent its output, right? It might want to make it openly available. In fact, often that's the purpose of federal government research for uh, it to be widely used. However, um, coming out of the Kyoto Accords, uh, looking at the issue of climate mitigation, there was an international effort to say, how can we identify the technologies that are directly related to reducing the amount of CO2 gas in the atmosphere, improving water quality, mitigating different kinds of uh, environmental damage. And so what was done there was a patent classification system was developed that links directly into our existing system so that we can actually track over time growth in at least patented technologies. And sometimes you will hear some of these referred to as net zero patents, but it actually is a wonderful framework 
that at least gives us some ability to measure. And so that really, the I find an important issue when we think about these challenges, how do we know what's happening? And if we can't measure it, it's going to be hard to have um, policy milestones that get met. So I think that that's one area uh, that we can think about. So Troy Etelin has a question about universities basically converting basic research into uh, uh, actual uh, products. So his specific question is, how can we address the R&D that happens in universities and the challenges in transforming discoveries and insights into what he calls accessible, socially valuable products, services, and systems? So basically, how can we move from the basic research to the actual application? Well, I'll, I'll take a stab with that. It's a hard, it's a, it's a broad question. We could have a whole separate session on that. Um, but I, I would say that I think there's a, a, at least in engineering, I, I've seen over the years, a pretty well-trodden path of people, you know, university professors who do research on topic and then go on to found, uh, to recognize the, the, the commercial opportunities that are resulting from that research and go on to, to spin off companies. And, and many times those companies do extremely well. So I think that's a, uh, and I think universities, it is important for universities to provide a climate that um, is subject to obviously, you know, making sure that, you know, proper dollars are spent in the proper way and all that kind of thing to encourage that kind of thing. Because, you know, who, who better to know how to apply a technology than the people who have actually uh, developed it themselves. So I think that's a, I think that's a, uh, uh, something that has happened and will continue to happen. And, and there's plenty of companies that are household names now uh, that arose from, you know, people doing work in universities. So one thing that I would add is that the funding agency can be explicit if that is in fact the intended goal, right, of the funding to translate innovation results into society, right, as I described this TIP program. However, again, we don't want to, um, well, we have traditionally relied upon universities to produce basic science. And so being clear about what, what is wanted from the research I think is going to be most helpful. And um, segmented projects that say the intention of this is to find something that can be translated into uh, public use is one way to do it. But I wouldn't want us to turn all of our attention to that and turn away from basic research because as John mentioned earlier, the benefits of this may not be apparent now. We won't know them for 10 or 20 years. So we have an interesting question from Spencer Douglas of the Defense Intelligence Agency. So he wants to know what we can do to encourage risk taking in a culture that he says is very risk adverse. I'll let John do that one. You know, I, I guess I would say that it is certainly the case that in, that there are aspects of, of, of university research culture that are risk averse, but there's also quite a few people and, and there's also an aspect of taking risks. And I guess I would say also that it, it's very seldom that, that university research completely fails. Um, what you, ra rather it generally either really succeeds or it does decently and sort of adds, you know, kind of marginally to the knowledge of something without necessarily hitting it out of the park. But you don't see a whole lot of abject failures in, in university research. Um, and I think uh, encouraging risk taking is, you know, partly a function of the culture at universities, but it's also partly a function of the, of the funding agencies, right? In the sense of being willing to fund you know, they have to be, you know, if they want to take risks, they have to be willing to fail, right? That's the definition of risk, right? Is that it, it may not work. And so um, I think it has, there has to be a culture in the funding agencies as well of, of understanding. And I think there is to some extent this culture that not everything that they fund is going to live up to the aspirations of the people who originally proposed the funding. Uh, so we can do better in that respect, but I think there is, you know, a fair amount of kind of work that's done where the payoff isn't certain. And sometimes the payoff is far better than anyone imagined, like the internet. And sometimes the payoff isn't as necessarily quite as good, but it's still contributed to training students and advancing knowledge. Yeah, the one thing that I would add is that um, when a research program is focused on a particular outcome, it looks like a failure if that outcome wasn't reached in the intended time period 
And so perhaps being open to alternative uses uh, from the outcomes of research can be useful because then that, that will um, perhaps allow us not to drop a project, but find a way to continue it or send it off in another direction. And then again, as John uh, suggests, you get what you, um, what you ask for. And so if you only reward short-term results, then you are going to get cautious researchers. The, the, uh, the other thing I'd, I'd add is sometimes it's only in hindsight that it's really easy to appreciate how much risk there was. Uh, I'll give an example. Again, in the 90s, DARPA funded quite a lot of work in a technology called CMOS. It's all capital C-M-O-S. It's a particular sort of semiconductor category. And at that time, it was unclear whether that semiconductor technology could be used to build very low power, high speed you know, processors of the kind that are all over the place in our mobile phones and things like that these days. It was a high risk endeavor and, and, it, and it worked, it paid off, but, but we don't tend to remember you know, when we sort of walk around with all these amazing, you know, devices that we have today, we don't tend to remember that that was the product of what was at that time very high risk uh, research. Uh, but that's that's what it was, and it succeeded in that in that. But so I'm just mentioning it's it's not always obvious even in the moment that it's high risk. So Sheldon Fishman has a question about accountability in the R and D space, and he specifically asks, what are the guardrails for transparency and accountability in order to increase public trust in what we're doing in the R&D space and how we're spending federal money. So I, I would like to take a stab at that. And I think that that is an approach which is, uh, it's a challenge in the academic community and it's obviously a challenge in the federal government. But what we are seeing is increasingly um, an emphasis on transparency, on providing the data sets so data can be replicated. I think that that really is one of the most critical things. I think um, results that use data that no one can look at are things that we have to be less confident in than when one can rerun the data and uh, see that we get the same results. Those things are very important. And I also think that open access and in increased open access overall to the results of research will help here as well. Yeah, I'll just I'll just second that. I mean, sometimes I'm looking for a research article and I find it online and it says I, you know, asks if I want to pay thirty dollars to read the article. And you know, I'm not going to do that. It, it just, you know, and, and if, if that was funded from federal dollars, it seems reasonable that we should have the access to it without paying. Uh, research from the National Institutes of Health, of course, have been public for many years and they have a wonderful database. And the National Science Foundation also has the principle that the um, results of research shall be open and made available to the public. So Anna Quinden of Northern Illinois University has a question about the CHIPS Act. Uh, she uh, cites, uh, says there's a newly created emerging research institutions designation within the CHIPS Act. And she wants to know how that can help us reach the goal of expanding the footprint for research institutions and also engaging a, a more diverse pool of both students and faculty. So maybe I can take a stab at that. I, I may be mistaken, but I think the Emerging Research Institutions designation has been around for quite a while. I think um, the National Academies did a report, uh, I think it was over 10 years ago on these. Now, I don't know whether the CHIPS Act definition is the same as, as, as what was used earlier, um, but the questioner is absolutely correct that there is this focus uh, in the CHIPS Act um, and I think, I think it might, again, I may be misspeaking, but I think it, it defines emerging research institutions as colleges and universities that have less than $50 million in federal research expenditures. And there's, a, I think, a certain percentage of the awards that have to go to those institutions. And I think that, um, that will indeed, uh, I think it will achieve its goals, right? By definition, by sort of programmatic structure, it is going to uh, ensure that some of these dollars, a significant amount of these dollars go to the institutions. And as I mentioned before, I think there's an extraordinary depth of talent uh, in this country, much of which is not at what you might traditionally call a, you know, an R1 research institution. So I think it is, is all upside. Uh, and I think, I think that's going to have the obvious benefits, which is put research dollars in the hands of people who might not otherwise have received them. But I think it's going to have a bunch of downstream benefits that are good benefits, really important benefits that are hard to even sort of fully appreciate now. 
And so I, I would add that there are two parts of this that I think are a benefit. And I agree with John that that is the intention there. And we do see some of these programs being set up. So in addition to training the workforce um, in areas where, which perhaps is outside of Silicon Valley Research Triangle in Boston, the presence of these newly trained, highly skilled workers also allows for economic development, right, in higher technology industries. And that provides an additional benefit because, of course, what we've seen in the past is that graduates from very fine universities in the center of the country end up going to the coasts, right, to look for their jobs and not staying there where they were trained to build businesses. And if I could just, I'm sorry, one more thought on this. You know, we've focused a lot on federal funding when we talk about public funding, but state legislatures have, have play a role in this, is, this is also. And I think um, this is an area that's complementary to the question in the sense that state legislatures can and should be investing in their university systems, including in supporting developing a, a, a strong R&D ecosystem. Uh, and so I think that's a really important part of the puzzle as well. It's not just federal funding here that can shape uh, these sorts of issues. Uh, that's a great point. And we actually do have a question about state and local government and the resources that they are uh, putting in. This is from uh, Kim Bobola, who wants to know, what can we hope for at the state and local level in terms of yeah. R&D spending? Uh, are they tending to invest in similar sorts of things as the federal government? Are they doing things differently? How, how should we assess their role in the whole ecosystem? The first thing that I would say is that state level funds are very limited for R&D. Uh, state budgets are under enormous pressure. And so uh, expecting that there will be great growth coming from state governments into the local institutions is probably uh, not the best place to where we're going to get help, more in terms of perhaps um, supporting the kind of consortiums and technology transfer um, and helping set up robust institutions, right? Where perhaps the state and local government, the universities and industries are working together. Yeah, I, I would just agree with that. I mean, you're never going to have a state funding research at the level of, you know, DARPA or National Science Foundation or National Institutes of Health. It's just the, the budgets don't exist. But I also do think that states can, and in many cases are, be more than simply passive bystanders uh, to the research ecosystems uh, in the university systems in their states. And I think, you know, states can do a better or worse job on fostering a climate which makes faculty want to set up shop at the universities in their state, you know, pr pr providing funding for the sort of uh, the kind of capital funding for research labs and things like that, because, you know, uh, the National Science Foundation isn't going to fund a university to build a big new science building, right? That's not the kind of thing, as far as I'm aware, that NSF, NSF funds. Um, and that kind of funding is going to need to come from, from other sources. So states can, can still play a really important role in providing the infrastructure that can then make it easier for universities in that state to attract external private and federal government funding for research, and that can help grow the ecosystem. I think an example of what's, what John is mentioning is certainly what was done in New York State around semiconductor and nanotechnology research. They have built a very large research program and certainly there's federal funds, but in terms of uh, setting up the equipment and the infrastructure, the state had to have played a very major role. So we have a question from uh, uh, Jenny Majadiar, and she wants to know, has there been any major reforms or institutional changes in federal R&D uh, funding over the last few years? And then she wants to know, in addition, are there any uh, new policy initiatives and major programs at the federal level. Are there any interesting examples of public-private partnerships uh, that uh, can be uh, mentioned in this area? Well, certainly the one that comes to mind is the CHIPS Act, right? That is a major piece of legislature legislation with a lot of money behind it. And so I think that that is one thing that we can point to. In terms of changing policy, I think if we look at some of the orders that have come out of the executive branch, there is a shift towards more inclusivity. So that perhaps is another uh, policy direction as well. John, any thoughts from you on that? Uh, nothing New else. New initiatives or? 
Okay, uh, we have a question from Tamar Bauer, who's a senior advisor for strategy and policy. And uh, she wants to know if there are any insights regarding the role of R&D from both the public and private sectors in solving major national social problems, such as poverty, hunger, education, and I would add healthcare in there as well. Yeah, absolutely. So when we think about hunger, right, we think about our food supply and we think about the production um, and science uh, and innovations have been significantly behind this disease resistant crops. Another example is um, vitamin enriched rice, right, which is grown in other parts of the world. So those are pretty important things with regard to hunger. Um, certainly, we know that there have been many advances that directly affect um, health. And in terms of poverty, obviously, now we are thinking about the role of social science, and that, that's a bit more complex. Um, I think that increasing access to education is certainly an important part of this challenge. Uh, Sura Ragu of ET Cube International uh, makes a comment and says, the metrics used to measure technology transfer by universities are very limited. And so this person wants to know, are there better ways to do this? Uh, can we get better data so we actually are in a better position to track the technology transfer uh, uh, that do take place? And in general, how do we overcome some of the problems in terms of transferring the knowledge from universities uh, into uh, the rest of the country? So I would agree that the data that we have on technology transfer is somewhat limited. As I mentioned, um, not, all, uh, or not all universities have a technology transfer office. And so the data which I use in my report, Science and Engineering Indicators, can on only comes from universities that have technology transfer offices. Um, and so expanding that set of information, I think would be useful. But I think that the questioner uh, has something in mind, knowledge exchange, right? Which perhaps is a broader set of variables than the limited ones, which are on startups and licensing and patents. And so there one has to begin to define what do you, what do you mean? Okay, another way we can do it is collaborations. One can look at collaborations between universities uh, and one does that in a couple of different ways, but one way is to look at who is co-authoring on a piece of research. Um, and what one often finds is that uh, the collaborations take place between the people in the R1 universities or perhaps the R1 universities and some of the best universities in other parts of the world. And not as often, than between perhaps a flagship university in a state and then some of the other um, associated public universities that aren't quite as research intensive. So perhaps developing uh, more specific metrics there is something that's quite possible. I'm trying to kind of think of what's in the realm of possible without standing up new surveys because that's a long and complicated process. I would add that, you know, again, uh, since I'm at, at UCLA, I see it uh, there. The technology transfer office at UCLA, I, I think they do a, a good job, but they only see a, I think, a fraction of you know, what might be called the transfer of innovation culture, right? I mean, you, if you have a, a graduate student who gets a, earns a PhD in engineering and then, you know, goes and starts a company after graduating or joins a small company or joins a big company, uh, there is, I think, an, a, a transfer of, of innovation capacity that goes along with that person that is never going to be measured by just looking at, say, a licensing, you know, a count, of, count of licenses or a assessment of the dollars from licensing. And I actually think if you could quantify it, more of the innovation transfer would be, you know, happening organically in that fashion than through contracts and licensing that you could actually sort of hold in your hand and count. The question or the challenge, and perhaps this is what the, the questioner is getting at, is how do you sort of measure that other than just say it's important, which is not necessarily particularly satisfying if you're trying to sort of assess it. I don't have a good answer to that, but I know just organically kind of looking at it, that it's a huge, huge aspect of the ecosystem is, you know, we, all these people getting these engineering degrees, going out and entering the workforce, starting companies. I mean, it's just a huge, huge benefit there. 
on a university by university basis, what I have seen are very nice reports looking at the job trajectories of alumni. And that enables one to take a deep dive into the kind of issues that John is mentioning, right? Has, have, did you go down the road and start a company somewhere else? Or how many people did you hire? And so I would, uh, I suppose, suggest that the questioner could look there to begin with. So we begin to get some idea of what are the most salient questions that are on those alumni surveys and find some way to translate that more broadly. So Minerva Tantico of NYU has a question, how can AI and other emerging technologies be used to increase equity instead of reducing it? And of course, there's a lot of criticism today that technology is making inequality worse. Is there some way to use federal R&D monies to place a greater emphasis on equity or to think about how technology can be part of the solution as opposed to part of the problem? I mean, I take a stab at that. Well, first of all, I think, I mean, it, there is certainly a concern with AI and equity, but I would also sort of uh, argue that there's also a huge concern of e with equity when AI isn't involved. In other words, you know, even when there's no AI, there's a lot of equity concerns. And so it's, you know, AI can often through data analysis actually help expose and make clear inequities that would have been perhaps harder to identify absent the AI. So AI can be part of the solution as well as part of the problem. And in terms of the funding link, I would expect that any funding agency that is funding AI work, or at least, or at least AI work where there's an equity issue, um, you know, if you're funding AI to develop better protein folding, then, then you know, that, then maybe that particular, you know, AI system, it's not equity isn't as much in question. But if you're funding AI in a way that impacts or could impact equity, I would imagine, I would assume that there's a very high degree of awareness about the importance of equity. And similarly, among people who are requesting, who are seeking funding for AI work, I can't imagine seeking funding to do work on AI where I didn't sort of put front and center, if it was appropriate, you know, given the context, some of the equity issues. So, um, you know, the one of the benefits for the very high degree of awareness in the public conversation about AI and equity is that it really is a top of mind topic. And I'm cautiously optimistic that, that we're really moving in the right direction in that respect. So the only thing that I would add is that, um, and this is a bit of a technological argument, to the extent that artificial intelligence allows us to do things that were skill intensive much more quickly, then I think it makes much technology more accessible. And the example that I would give is a, using AI as a means to diagnose illnesses in a way that was more expensive to do perhaps um, with a radiologist or um, with highly skilled professionals. And so then the issue is we have created something new which can be provided at a lower cost. How do we make sure that that is available to more of the population? That is only a partial solution to the challenge that the questioner addresses. And the thing I would add to uh, the answers that each of you gave is just the importance of investing in lifelong learning, right? Now our education model and our investments in human tap, uh, cap, uh, uh, talent uh, basically go up through about age 25 or 30. And then after that, people are on their own. And I think in an era where there's going to be a dramatic acceleration of technology innovation, we're going to have to invest in people upskilling and reskilling at ages 30, 40, 50, and 60, basically throughout uh, people's lifetimes. And so as a society, we have to figure out how to do that uh, and also who's going to pay for that. I think those are social contract types of questions that are part of this uh, equity uh, question. Uh, Fallon uh, Yeneg, who's the Director of Economic Strategy, asks uh, about the link between workforce as a key to R&D development and how we should think about high-skilled immigration and the domestic workforce development, how we can have policies, workforce policies that are more optimal in order to boost domestic R&D. So I guess what I would say about this is it's, it's not an either or, it really is a both, right? Um, we have industries that are relying now on foreign-born talent and taking that away would likely be quite damaging to those industries. But again, I think that there's a complementariness between these really highly skilled workers and the development of a STEM workforce that um, has perhaps less 
than an advanced degree and that those things really can go hand in hand. But critical to this, I think, we would find is improving our K through 12 science and engineering education system, because we need to get to the point where our young people are able to uh, tackle physics and calculus when they get to community college so that they can go into the more technically oriented programs. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just second that. You know, I, I couldn't agree more that we frankly should do a better job. Uh, at our K through 12 education, and particularly with terms of encouraging people to consider and perhaps go into STEM careers. And the other thing I'll say is, you know, high school immigration uh, and frankly, immigration of all skill levels has been the absolutely foundational part of American economic growth and prosperity. And uh, net net, I think creates, um, you know, creates jobs. Um, and so I, I really hope that we can over the long term adopt and maintain a policy where we welcome the world's best and brightest to come here and bring their talent and skills here and with all the job creation and short and long-term benefits that, that involves. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Mel Caps of editor and publisher uh, asks whether there are ways to create a more deliberate and programmatic collaboration between public and private sectors, particularly involving what he calls uh, R1 and R2 uh, research uh, universities, and would that represent another kind of model in, in order to spur innovation in the United States? So I would say yes, and I would say that this uh, Technology Innovation Partnerships Program uh, out of the National Science Foundation newly stood up has exactly that kind of promise, because indeed, if an idea is coming out of research, well, it's going to end up having to make this transition, right, from the research into something which is useful and viable and then uh, provided somehow to consumers. And so it's natural, I think, that when we focus on this use-inspired research and translation of results, that that will, by necessity, involve that kind of uh, partnership between the public and the private sector. John, your thoughts on public-private partnerships? Yeah, I think I think it can be really effective. I think it's very context-specific. Um, you know, what works in one particular at one particular time and in one particular area may not be the right thing in another area. But I think it's absolutely needs to be on the table because there's there's a subset of of context of problems where that is going to be by far the best way to sort of get impact over a moderately reasonably short time scale. So I think I think it's absolutely a, a it, it's a, it should definitely be in the portfolio uh, that people have when they consider how to do public, public center funding. Well, I want to thank both uh, John and Carol for sharing your perspectives on R&D and how we can do a better job in this area. Uh, we write regularly about these questions as well as other aspects of uh, technology innovation at brookings.edu. Uh, you can check out our Tech Tank blog uh, where we undertake uh, research and present a commentary on leading issues affecting the uh, digital economy. We also have a Tech Tank podcast uh, where we uh, host uh, interviews of experts who are devoted to discussing these issues. So for our audience, uh, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. And uh, John and Carol, thank you very much uh, for your okay. insights.